Hey, Brian, it's so good. It genuinely is so good to be with you this morning. I do thank you for the introduction. feel like we're family. Hopefully, if you think about your family down the road, Rosebank, you don't think of us as your weird aunts and uncles and cousins, because we all have those, right? So hopefully, you do think of us as genuine brothers and sisters in Christ, which we are partners with you. We do absolutely have the same hearts, obviously, for Jesus and, and definitely for Joburg as well. So we're grateful for you all and what you're doing here. And it's a joy for me to be with you this morning. It kind of feels like I'm on holiday. I am actually going on holiday tomorrow, but it feels like a holiday being here, just away from the norms uh, of kind of my church life. And so I'm really glad to be with you this morning and happy to share with you what I hope is going to be uh, an encouraging message for you. I'm going to talk this morning, subject I know you all know a ton about. All I want to talk about today is aspects of the doctrine of the love of God. That's what we're going to talk about. Why? Because why not? This is a great thing to talk about. Yes, the love of God, the love that He has for us. Also, I think because I feel as David feels post Easter, you know, Easter's a high, and it was genuinely a high for me this year. And there is always a little bit of a come down from that, and it shouldn't be. And so I want to help that process this morning that we just um, live with, in, with mindfulness of the love of God for us. But I think the other reason that I want to kind of address this topic this morning is because as I've come to realize in my own life that we often have uh, some misunderstandings about this doctrine of the love of God, which is so important that we understand correctly the doctrine of the love of God. And so to do that this morning, uh, we obviously can't talk about the whole thing. So we're just going to have a look at a couple of verses in the book of 1 John. So if you have Bibles with you, you can turn or tap in your Bibles to 1 John. And uh, I just heard now that you guys were maybe reading through John in the week. So that's great. That's a good setup for this. Uh, It shouldn't be a surprise if you want to talk about love and the love of God. Apostle John, he's known as the Apostle of Love because he writes about it so much, especially in the book of 1 John. And so we're just going to have a look at six verses today in chapter 4. So read with me 1 John chapter 4 and reading from verse 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. So I want to walk through that passage this morning, just two verses at a time. And so let's just start by just focusing again on those those first two. Let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God, because God is love. So according to John here, the test of whether you have been born of God, the test of whether you know God, is whether you are loving or not. If you are not loving, then according to John, you are not a Christian. Now, I know that sounds like really hectic, and generally I'm not very much a confrontational guy, but I suppose being a guest preacher, you're allowed to be, so I'll take that liberty. But actually, I'm not, I'm not saying that. It's, it's here. There's a lot we're going to talk about this morning that I think is really deep and rich and complex and beautiful, but not at this point. This is quite simple. Listen, I'm not saying it's easy to be loving, but it's not complicated. What John is saying quite clearly is that love for one another is evidence that you are a Christian. The absence of love in your life for others is evidence that you are not a Christian. Anyone, let me say it again, who knows God, who has been born of God's Spirit, 
will be a loving type of person, period. And that makes sense. John connects the dots because he says God is love. And love is from God. And so if you know him and are connected to him in this life-giving way, because he is love, therefore then you will be a loving person. Because God is love, and love is from God. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on just those two statements. God is love, verse 8, and love is from God, verse 7. There's a lot of really rich, deep, complex things that we can say about the love of God just from the statement, but I want to try and just simplify it by talking about three mistakes that we make sometimes in our thinking about the love of God attached to this kind of language. So just keep in your minds this language, God is love and love is from God. And we point out three mistakes we make in our thinking about God's love. So first mistake we make is instead of truly saying or truly understanding that God is is love, we replace the word is with has. So instead of saying God is love in our thinking, we think God has love. What I mean is that sometimes our perception of the love of God is that he possesses the capacity to love. He has that capacity to love. And what I want to say is that technically, and you'll see why this is important, I'm not just being grammar police here this morning, but technically, God does not possess love. God does not possess the capacity to love. What this is saying is God is love. In other words, his love is not disconnected from his essential eternal being. That's just very different. I think for a lot of Christians, when we, when we think about the love of God, we put it in this category, and scholars do use this terminology, but in a very particular way, but we put it in this category of one of the attributes of God. And we do talk about attributes of God, that He is holy, and He is just, and He is loving. But good scholars don't talk about the attributes of God in a way that they are disconnected from His essential personhood. He does not just possess the capacity to love. I would say he doesn't possess the capacity to love. He is love. His love is not disconnected from his essential, eternal being. And what I'm speaking about, Jan, you can have a, if you, if, you, if you want to go and investigate this, you can have a whale of a time, go and investigate in the doctrine of divine simplicity. That'll be a whole lot of fun that you can go and have later. That's what I'm talking about. But here's why this is important. Now we get this right, that this is not an attribute of God that is separated from his being and separate from his other attributes. A few reasons why this is important. Firstly, if we think about God in terms of these attributes that make up his personality, if we think about him, therefore, as the sum of different parts, not his essential personhood, what we'll be tempted to do is to rank those parts. If he's just the sum of different parts, if God is love plus holiness plus, and they're just parts of him, what we tend to do is rank them. So, for example, greatest cake that you can ever have is a black forest cake. If you've never had a black forest cake, let me describe it to you. It's quite simple. It's really not complicated. I don't understand why I've only ever had one good Black Forest cake in my life. It's really just made up of three different parts. And number one, you've got chocolate cake, like, you know, rich, moist, but not wet, spongy chocolate cake. Then you've got cream, like rich, sweet, velvety, it must like glisten cream. I'm making you all hungry now, right? But at this point, what do you have? You just have chocolate cake. What makes, what makes it Black Forest cake is that third ingredient, which is cherries. But like bitter, but sweet at the same, like tarts, like this cheeriness. You know, you add the cherries, now you've got a black forest cake. Now you've got the greatest cake in the universe. It's a cake just made up of three parts, but I would argue to you, the one part is more important than the other part, and that is the cherry part, right? And so sometimes when we think of God as just these sum of different parts, that's what we do. Now, this is going to be really important. Just hold on to that. You'll see why that's important in a moment. But second reason why we, ha- we can't think of God as just the sum of different parts, and I really hope you can understand this today when it comes to the love of God, 
if you can see that it's not just an attribute disconnected from his being, here's what that means. Just one statement that I really hope you get this morning. And that's to say that what that means is, therefore, God's love is uncaused. Just think about that for a second. Those are not my words. I read those. But God's love is therefore uncaused. Because it's his very essence, this is who he is that's connected to his divine, eternal being, and not just an attribute, it means, therefore, that God can love us unconditionally. If it's just an attribute, then we would think he has the capacity to love, but God doesn't try to be loving because God is love, that means he will always love us unconditionally. See, when we think of attributes, personality, and different virtues that people have, for example, patience, you might think of someone and go, they're a really patient person. You know, I picked on, I picked on Dave this morning and said, you know, I mean, I don't know Dave that well, but go, if we are about to say Dave is a really patient person. What, that, what I'm thinking is he has the capacity to be patient, more so than other people that I've met. But I, I mean, if I know human beings, that does not mean his capacity to be patient is unlimited. You know, if you think of me as a patient person, like, I mean, I, I don't think I am, but hey, I'm New Year. You don't know me. I'm a patient person. But I, I have limits. And I try to be really patient But man, at some point, that patience is going to run out, and I'm going to run out of the capacity to be patient. It's limited. But because the love of God is not this kind of attribute, because it's connected to who He is, He doesn't try to be loving. That therefore means that we can sing songs like we just sang in that line that we repeated, the love of God is like a mighty ocean, that's never going to stop, or something like that. Ms. Coy David, never going to run out. You can't sing that line, the love of God won't run out, if you don't have this understanding that it's because it's connected to his divine, eternal essence. So when you sing that line, that his love will never run out. For me, you can know that because of those three words, God is love. If you think God just has love and has the capacity to love, you might genuinely walk around going, yes, he loves me, but it is going to run out because you don't know me and you don't know what I've done. And there are people who walk around with this debilitating sense that of God's love for me has run out because he has the capacity to love. And sure, I've been told his capacity is bigger than a human capacity. I get that. But what you don't know is what I've done, that capacity has run out. But I'm reminding you this morning, no, God does not have love. He is love. That capacity never runs out. So you can know because God is love that he loves you and loves you unconditionally and you cannot exhaust his love because of this little doctrine that God is love. Maybe you're wondering, though, about verse 7 and verse 8, about the difference from love is from God and God is love. Let me clear that up quite simply. That's not a contradiction. To say love is from God is to say, is similarly to say heat is from fire. It, you know, fire doesn't try to be hot and irradiate heat. It, it is a fire, and because of its being, it radiates heat. So love is from God. You will feel and experience and can know the love of God because God is love. Make sense? So that's one mistake I think we make around this language of God and love. God is love. God does not have love. Second mistake we make is we add a word to God is love, and we, or at least we think, when we think about the love of God, we think God is only love. This takes us back to why it's really important that we do not think of God as just the sum of parts and therefore rank them in order of importance. Because if love is just an attribute, and we know as good Christians that he is also holy and also just, but if they're attributes and we rank them, it's very tempting to say that God is love, but disregard that he is also holy. He is, doesn't try to be, 
His holiness is also connected to his essential divine eternal being. And his justice is also, he doesn't try to be just. God doesn't sit there going, well, I think as deity of the earth, I need to try and be just. It's, it's an, also an extension of his very essence. And I know it's hard to get our minds around, and that's why we separate them and think of God as the sum of these different parts. But when you do that and you rank, it's so tempting to highlight that God is only love and disregard that he is also holy and also just. And if you take away God is holy and God is just from God is love, you have no need for a cross. There is no Christian gospel message if God is only love. So we remember that he is love, but he is also holy and he is also just. If he's only love and we disregard his holiness and his justice, then when you think of the problem of evil and sinfulness in the world, then you've got to think of God as kind of this being going, well, what you can do, humans, these days? You know, turn a blind eye towards it. The only reason we needed a cross, and that's why I want to talk about this after Easter, because it only makes sense. The cross only makes sense because God is love, but he is also holy, and only the cross can put those two things together and give us a complete picture of who God is. And I say that as well because I think if you had to walk down the street and just interview various people on their perception about God, and granted, a lot of people have this negative view, but, but taking that aside, if you're just interviewing somebody, like I don't know if you do Alpha Course, but there's those videos and they do this, interview people, and if someone has a positive view of God generally, but they're not Christian, they don't really know things, but it, most people just ask them, what's your view of God? Love comes to mind. Just a lot of people would say that kind of thing, you know, God is love. And listen, it is not wrong to use the word love when describing God. I've just made a case for that, but it's not complete. He is, he is love, but he is not just love. He is love and he is holiness, and he is righteousness. Got that? Third mistake we make. So God is love, not God has love, not God is only love. The second little way I think we, we have a misconception about the love of God is we swap the order and say love is God. At least when we think about God and love, as we sometimes have this idea of love is God. And here's what I mean by that. Firstly, what that sentence can kind of sum up for us is this idea, again, in the world today, um, love is God is this impression of kind of a pantheistic, over-romanticized, esoteric sort of view of love and God, and love is here, and love is there, and love is in the tree, and God's in the tree, and the tree's in me, and I feel it in my fingers, I feel it in my toes, and I feel it everywhere it goes. You know what I mean? It's that kind of picture of God and love and love is God. But what we're saying and what John has been very explicit about, no, God is love and he is this transcendent being. He is love. What I mean is he defines love. God defines love. When we want to know what love is, we look at God and we're going to get to how he manifests that to us. But I think that, again, for what's happening in the, in the world is love. We have to rescue or rescue, clarify for people, God sets the tone. He defines it. We get our view of what love is from God, not from these other ideas. Which is the second little, little danger here on, on love is God. And that's where this idea of romantic love, where it's all-consuming. This all-consuming aspect of mainly romantic love where we start to feel that if we don't have it, then, I mean, we might, we might as well be dead or, or we feel worthless. Love is God. You know, think about my high school years, which is a long time ago. But if I think about high school years, the worst day of the year, hands down. Some of you know where this is going? Valentine's Day. Right, I don't know if they still do this today, but I mean, they did this at my school, and I, I went to school in the South, so just putting that out there, just forgive them. But 
they would come in, like the prefects would come in with this little trolley, and on this trolley, all these Valentine's gifts that you prearranged and ordered for your secret crush, you know. And, and the hard thing is that trolley comes in, you start going, oh, man, this, you know, just waiting for, the, hopefully, that person that you've had your eye on has like, sent you this thing. And they start calling out names, and, and your name's not being read, you know. And then they're like, there's still more, you're like, but there's still more, I know there's more, I have a chance here. And then they go, that's all for this class, and they go to the next class, and then you like, crushed, you know? And I mean, I'm not I'm making a little bit of a joke about that. Although I think at the time it was actually quite tough, but I'm, I know that this is actually hard for us, like apart from Valentine's stuff. I say this carefully because people who I, I know that you long for love and don't have it, how painful that actually is. Just long for romantic love and don't have it. Or who've had it and had it taken away from them. Tragically, perhaps, or due to betrayal. Like, I get how deep, the, I get how much pain is caught up in this idea of love is God and how much we need it. But I, yet, recognizing that, still have to say that love is not God. And romantic love is not God. God is love. And what we're seeing is that he gives it lavishly in a way that absolutely does fulfill all of our needs for any kind of love. And it's the love of God that defines our sense of value and our sense of worth, not human romantic love. So I just have to say that. Love is not God. God is love. So that's point number one, is that love is from God. I've got two more points. They won't be as long as the first one. These guest preachers, what are you going to do? They've always gone too long, right? So number two, love is made visible in the sun. So remember, I said God gets to define what love is. And he's shown it. He's shown us what Love is, and that's in these next two verses. In this, the love of God was made manifest, revealed, displayed to us that he sent his son into the world so we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to, to be the propitiation for our sins. Here's all I really want to say about this, but this connects to Easter. The showing to the world of God's love, the unveiling of God's love to the world, if you like, the revealing, the manifesting of God's love was a public affair carried out among human beings just like you and I so that we could see it and appreciate it. In other words, the love of God isn't this mysterious secret message esoteric kind of thing that you struggle to get your head around. No, he meant public with his love. That's what this says. The love of God was made manifest in God the Son coming to earth in human flesh and dying this atoning sacrifice for us. It happened in the public eye. And again, all I really want to say, is what that means for us is you don't have to wonder about whether God loves you. So I said that before with the whole connection to the essence of his love. So you can, you can only love. You don't have to wonder if God loves you. He does. But maybe you thought, okay, I'm not quite sure that applies like, practically to human beings. Well, here it is. In other words, love is not only God's eternal nature. It's a historical fact. We need that as human beings. We do. You know, you think about love, it's hard. I get it to make this connection with God and love and, and me. But because it was carried out, demonstrated in public among us, you don't have to wonder about the love of God for you. And I say that again, and this is my burden today, is because I just I know that as human beings, we're always going to be insecure in our love with each other as human beings. Like always. I think we grow in that. But let's just acknowledge we're always going to be insecure in it. I've been married to my wife this year for 10 years. And still there's things that come up in conversation that make me realize I'm still a little bit insecure. 
in the love that she has for me. And who knows, maybe one day, if, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I like, like grow old and cranky and start to really smell a lot and I don't know, you know, lose my obviously great sense of humor, you know, like then she's not really going to love me anymore. And, and I get that as human beings, we're deeply insecure in our love for each other. And that's because, I mean, for us, our love is a response to conditions around us. It's a response to circumstances. I can love mainly if I feel like it's going to be reciprocated, then I can love more. If the person, the object of my love gives me a sense of value, I mean, you know all of this, but it's, our love is dependent on certain conditions and circumstances, but God's isn't. It is uncaused. It's part of his essential being. I get that we're going to be insecure in our love with each other. What you do not need to be insecure about is the love that God has for you. And I want to say that as clearly as I can, because it's right here. God is love. He displayed that love amongst ordinary human beings for us to see and appreciate and receive. All right, let me move on a little bit. Number three. So love is from God. Love is made visible in the sun. Number three, love must be demonstrated by God's people. Love must be demonstrated by God's people. This just takes us to the beginning. So John, that's how John organized us. He started with, we love because God loved us. He ends with, we love because God loves us. Now, I could just end there and go, this is the love of God. Isn't it beautiful? And we go, yes. And I go, now, go love each other. Boom, BBC, you can do it. But that wouldn't be accurate, according to the Scriptures. Also wouldn't be very gospel-like, because what I'm leaving you with is just a big burden. Because if you're like me, I can be vulnerable with you this morning, because, hey, I'm not your pastor, so I can be imperfect. He's perfect. These guys are perfect. But I'm not great at being loving. And maybe you sitting there thinking, okay, now I need to be loving. You're struggling to love people that you know you should be loving. And so I've just given you a burden if I said, you must love because God loves you, so you must, and you walk away with a burden. Well, here's the good news. One last little tricky bit to handle in this passage here. When John tells us to love because God loves us, what he's not telling us to do is to, in a very superficial way, mimic God's love. I don't know if you get what I mean by that, but he's not just giving us, hey, so he's trying to mimic it. Like, here's a picture, and now you go and, and, and do likewise. Like, if you've seen, you know, somebody on TV making a black forest cake, you're like, oh, that looks beautiful. I'm going to go do it, and you do it, and it doesn't turn out like they made it. Anybody have those kinds of experiences? You're like, okay, God loves me like that, so I'm just going to go and reproduce that. And then you can't, and then you're really defeated by it. Well, this is a little bit different. Because what John is speaking about here is not just superficially mimicking God. What he's speaking about is kind of like, just picture a, a loop, closing a loop, a circle. And the idea is that you first receive the love of God. That's why he goes on to say, God first loved us. Not that we loved God. That's going to come. That's part of the Christian life. But he's saying God first loved us. That's important. And the picture here is you've received that. It's you, your essential personhood and being. And when you know that you're loved by God, and therefore you have no insecurity attached to love, at least when it comes to God, but because that's the most important kind of love, what that does is it gives you a sense of security. So with other people, therefore, you're not just walking around life trying to take love, take love, take love, because as human beings we do need and crave love. But now because you've been satisfied to some extent and feel fulfilled and feel loved, you have a sense of freedom that you can give love, but you can't if you haven't yet fully experienced the love of God and feel that security that He loves you. I think you kind of get this picture. I need to tell you it's in the language here. That's what John means when he says God's love abides in us and His love is perfected in us. The word perfected is like this word brought to consummation. The loop has been closed. We receive his love. It frees us from a lot, not all and one day, but frees us from our insecurities, our cravings, our reaching out for love so we're able to love others and that loop is closed. So maybe 
if you feel like you've been bad at loving, i.e., if you feel like a human being, and you hear this, and to be a Christian means to be loving. Maybe sometimes the reason we've been bad at loving is because you've never known that you're fully loved by God. That's all I wanted to tell you this morning, to remind you of this. You don't have to be insecure about this. Let's pray. Lord, I really do pray this morning, as we just a couple of weeks out from having spent time, both of our churches, churches around the world, reflecting on this divine love and this divine act of love. I pray this morning, that two weeks down the line, that this event in history that was this revealing, unveiling of divine love would take such deep root in us. Satisfy us. Satisfy us so that we can love others, those around us, those in our city. I do especially pray this morning, Father, for those who still feel unsure and insecure in their relationship with you. For those who think that maybe they have exhausted your love. Who sing these kinds of words that your love doesn't stop but don't really know I don't really believe it. I pray this morning. Lord Jesus, we've just celebrated you coming to earth, taking on human flesh, feeling our insecurities, experiencing our pain, offering yourself up for us to reconcile us back to you, Heavenly Father, a holy, righteous, loving God. It's impossible for us to think about being connected to you apart from this display of your love. But may that be completed and fulfilled in us this morning in such a beautiful way that frees us up to love others, to love you, to serve you, to run after you fully without hindrance. Would you do that for us and for this beautiful church? Amen.